require you the answer to that question is the concept describes the concept of self old answers where you are your mind and your body um, i like to to extend the concept of self to to other things like like the culture that you're surrounded with the environment that you're in, existing in uh, your private properties and all this happens over time in your mind uh, you might have cognition effect will and value according to a certain philosophy and what i noticed in interviews that you're giving that of all these things everyone is only focusing on cognition of yours what do you know what can you tell me about this supplement i would like to focus on you instead so my question to you is welcome Simland. who are you uh, <laughs> that's a good question and i think i consider myself as someone who is very interested in the human experience and the human species so i I've, I've, uh, have a background in anthropology so i'm more of like a curious human being wanting to understand the human animal better in all aspects of it and also kind of enhance the, uh, the our existence in the process Tell me your life story. How did you get here? Uh, I grew up on an island in the Baltic Sea. It's called Sarema and it's the biggest island in Estonia. It's a pretty natural environment. I grew up on the countryside uh, with me and my brother. And uh, yeah, we were just regular kids, mostly interested in like uh, fighting each other with uh, sticks and uh, you know, knights or uh, warriors and whatever just uh, kind of I don't know as a as a poor boy you're kind of interested in that kind of thing we didn't have like call of duty back then but <laughs> but we were like enacting uh, this uh, ourselves like you know Lord of the Rings or what have you and uh, yeah after uh, graduating high school at the age of 18 I also enrolled in the uh, Estonian uh, military service so this is a mandatory service here in Estonia. Did that for until I was 19 years old, and then I started studying uh, anthropology at uh, the Italian University, where I did it for the bachelor's degree. And after that, I just started my own uh, YouTube channel. I was already doing my YouTube channel during the last year of uh, university, and I just yeah figured I wasn't interested in, in becoming like an academic or doing like ethnographies with which what regular anthropologists would do I was more interested in uh, writing was still something of uh, like what I was deeply passionate about and what I was wanted to do so I uh, actually just wrote started writing my own books about uh, mostly health and uh, nutrition and uh, that kind of uh, topics and over the course of you know, by now it's like almost eight years I've been doing online content creation and I've just uh, been doing or been focusing on that for the last eight years and uh, growing my channels uh, over the past few years my focus has mostly shifted to longevity and uh, life extension so um, I don't I don't like cover it specifically on my channel that much but I do you know like like the idea of like the longevity escape velocity and just uh, human life extension with uh, science and uh, this advancements in medical technologies but uh, my own content is more down to earth of you know what are the actual practical things that you need to do to extend your life expectancy and uh, slow down aging so uh, yeah right now I've been focusing on these topics and uh, in total I've written like eight books uh, which are covering you know exercise nutrition and minerals and collagen and blood sugar and a lot of different topics and my ninth book is coming out in a few weeks it's gonna be about longevity and uh, it's called the longevity leap which is gonna be my best work by far 
most comprehensive, most evidence-based, and uh, and one of the most like one I'm most proud of as well. So, yeah, that's going to be the ninth uh, book on the list. You also have uh, right, some... Also, I'm also uh, married, so it's my second year in marriage. Uh, finishing second year all soon in a few uh, months, and. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my life story as so far. Well, well, it's interesting because all this led you to to reporting some some kickass results here. Because, for according to the research that I've done, for a while you were able to hold the record or the claim to have the lowest the need and pace pace of aging in the entire world that uh, that I could I could find. That's pretty interesting. So, so you 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 get to this point somehow. What was the number? Zero point six two, maybe. Uh, yeah, it was zero point six two uh, last year when I did the test. Of course, it's kind of outdated, and you know I never made it to the leaderboard as of now because it's uh, not been updated since uh, I guess September. <laughs> I haven't retested in a almost a half year, so I don't know what it is <laughs> right now. But I mean, there's you know many people who uh, have gotten scores of 0.61. Actually, one of my coaching clients, who uh, wasn't let's say super optimized with their lifestyle, actually got a score of 0.61, which is kind of interesting. I've uh, seen people with 0.6 even. Theoretically, 0.6 is the like the lowest speed that you could go. But the test itself is somewhat of a anomaly, or or it's uh, not clear what it's going to actually mean you know, in the long run. So it's a kind of interesting, interesting test and interesting uh, like leaderboard, but I wouldn't like put a lot of value or a lot of like emphasis on the test itself, like all the other biomarkers and some other re more traditional markers, I think are more uh, valuable in my opinion. By the way, I have found someone who apparently have 0 0.58. Uh, hopefully he can come to, to my show later on. Of course, there is this, uh, you, you can make a metaphor of a murder happened and you are, you are picking up the, the clues, what could have happened here. And maybe Dunedin pace is the equivalent of the clues, uh, the evidence of the murder. And if you, you clean up the evidence, like you clean up the Dunedin pace clock, that doesn't make you like make the murder not happen the murder happened already you know just uh, picking up the the traces that it left so that mm. that's uh, i i don't know how how much it's just a fingerprint or mm. yeah yeah well the the uh, at least the studies we do have right now is that a lower do not impace value is linked to a lower all cause mortality risk it's not actually one of the it's not the best marker for the biological age, there are other clocks that are more accurate for that, but it is good for the uh, which ones? Well, I think, uh, for example, the Horvath 1 and Horvath 2, at least uh, th those have the highest correlations uh, with uh, chronological age, and even like the Pheno age, which has a correlation of 0 0.94 and 0 0.96, uh, they're better than uh, the uh, Do Not In Pace. The do not basis for the all cause mortality risk is a bit, it's a, like a different thing, which I think is actually, you know, still slightly better because, you know, having a lower biological age, we don't know if it's going to actually translate over to greater, longer life uh, either. But, you know, having a lower risk of mortality kind of indicates that you're at least risk of dying to you in any cause, whether that be any of these uh, chronic diseases is uh, a bit lower. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, I wanted to know this exact same thing that you just said. My understanding is also that you don't really want to correlate with chronological age. You want to correlate with clinical outcomes. And as far as I understand, the Dunedin pace correlates better than the Horvath clocks. That and, well, is that enough of a correlation? Correlation, not causation, but right. it's quite a hint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of studies on them uh, as of now, so it will take a few, I guess, years to get more clarity. And, you know, by that time, we'll probably have like some better clocks as well. What do you think of, what's your general feeling about uh, longevity as a sport? Taking uh, or any sport in, an, in the elite level is probably like unhealthy to a certain extent. <laughs> so it probably applies to the longevity sport as well, if you can call it uh, that. 
at least with uh, regard to traditional sports, so like Olympic athletes, they do live longer than the uh, general population. So there was a 2021 study showed that uh, Olympic athletes had, uh, on average, five years longer life expectancy than uh, the general population. Uh, interestingly, women had, you know, general women generally have a longer life expectancy than men, almost like eight to ten years. But uh, the regular women who weren't Olympic athletes, they still had a longer life expectancy than uh, Olympic men as well. So even as a Olympic male, you have a lower life ex expectancy than than uh, the uh, general population woman, if that makes sense. <laughs> so there are like a lot of uh, sex specific differences in longevity. But regardless, to answer your question, then I think uh, anything in extreme can be you know, harmful, at least from a mental and psychological health uh, perspective. So I think uh, there's not a lot of evidence that having this sort of a very strict or hardcore biohacking routine is going to make you live longer. You know, Brian Johnson and uh, all these other people who are doing this, they're kind of hedging their bets for the longevity escape velocity. So their goal is to stay alive until the longevity of escape velocity occurs, or, you know, we don't know when it's going to happen, but after a certain point, your life expectancy is going to increase more than the year has passed. So like every year that has passed, thanks to the medicine, you'll stay alive for two more years. So uh, you're going to outpacing death. So their idea is that uh, right now, I'm just going to make sure that I don't die, literally, uh, that I don't die to anything <laughs> uh, for the time being, for the next few years, I'm going to be super strict with my dad, because uh, then in 10 years after the longevity escape velocity has occurred, then I'm going to get back the dividends of uh, 100 years of life expectancy, thanks to the medicine and the science. Of course, it's very theoretical. We don't have any evidence that it's going to happen or, you know, right now we don't even know. We don't know necessarily uh, like what to look at <laughs> with uh, that because we don't know clearly what causes aging. We, it's, it's been advancing quite a lot over the last decades, uh, but it's still a lot of unknowns. And of course, in humans, it's very hard to do these long-term uh, studies with regard to actually life extension and longevity. And even in animals, like we don't know how to consistently and reliably extend their lifespan exponentially. Like there are a few gold standard methods like, you know, the color restriction and the rapamycin treatment. Those are the, probably the two best ones. Uh, but uh, even then, you know, the, the mice still die at some point. <laughs> so they're not immortal. As I would say, there are like ca cases of uh, immortality in nature. So like these hydras and uh, certain uh, jellyfish uh, kind of uh, creatures, but uh, you know, you, you, we haven't like made mouse mice immortal uh, right now. So there's this kind of a smart idea to at least, you know, I'm going to do everything to not get heart disease and not get cancer and those things for the next few decades, because uh, the trend is that, you know, by the end of this century, even the more conservative estimates say that the average life expectancy is going to be above 90, at least in some countries like South Korea that are already pretty ahead with their uh, life expectancies. But uh, saying that it's going to make you live like 200, 300 years is a bit too early to say with, with no like evidence to really back it up. But it's more about like, yeah, hedging your bets. So uh, I'm gonna, it's like the marshmallow test. <laughs> you uh, say no to the marshmallow because you're gonna get two marshmallows at the end of the experiment. So it's kind of this um, mindset that uh, people in this space uh, have, which <coughs> I, do, I do think is, you know, obviously rational. Uh, makes sense to do that uh, but at the same time uh, if you look at the current longest living people in the world the centenarians and people the super centenarians then none of these people had any good health routines <laughs> none of these people took any supplements or exercised or anything like that they of course made it that to that far thanks to the genetics but it kind of goes to show that there are there's a lot of more wiggle room in longevity than people think like some people think that if you eat a cookie or some ice cream or if you had a beer or something like that, then you're immediately like, you know, disqualified from the longevity game and you're going to die <laughs> prematurely and you're never going to make it to 100. So like there's so many centenarians who drink whiskey and drink beer every day or wine and still make it to their 100s. Now you don't know your genetics. You don't know if you have these good genetics. If you have family members who made it to 100, then it's very likely that you have those same genetics as well. So like if you have 
parents uh, who have who have been centenarians, then uh, your likelihood of becoming a centenarian or your your likelihood of not getting heart disease is also like exponentially lower. And uh, yeah, I think it's smart to be careful and diligent with your diet and uh, exercise and those kind of things. But you also need to realize that it, the being super strict with it would make sense if you know you had the answer. <laughs> but that, that would require that you actually have proof that you what you're doing has the answer and uh, that it actually is reliably going to work in extending your lifespan. But uh, with all the information out there, we don't know what's the perfect diet for longevity. We don't know what's the perfect exercise routine for longevity. We don't know what are the perfect supplements for longevity. Of course, we know some things like we know some some diets and some uh, like exercise routines and some like biomarkers are linked to reduced mortality and reduced risk of heart disease, for example. But uh, it's still not 100% clear and there's so many other factors that can affect those results. So uh, if you are super strict with a particular routine, then you think this is the answer. But you, you can never know that this is the answer. It's always like just hedging your bets and taking the path of what makes most sense or what's the current evidence kind of indicates right now. What's your path? What's your routine? What's your, what is the day of, day of a life looks like in, 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 in sin life? When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to go outside, get exposed to some sunlight to help with the circadian rhythms and just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking the dog as well at the same time. So just uh, getting the day started after I come in, I'll have like tea, play with the dog a little bit. And uh, then after that, I'll just uh, start working on the computer. So it's going to be, you know, over the last eight months or so, it's been just mostly my book, writing it, uh, proofreading, uh, adjusting the dimensions and margins of the, of the copy and all those things. It's uh, been my work for the last eight months, almost 10 months now, actually. So, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing usually. But other times it can also be, you know, in the past, it would, might have been like editing videos. It might have been um, whatever else, researching, writing scripts for videos, uh, all those things. And then after a few hours, I'll do that maybe, you know, three hours, four hours usually. After that, I'll take a break, get outside a little bit again, more, more like a bright light exposure. I'll have like coffee. I'll have a protein shake to uh, get my daily protein intake in and uh, also support my workout. And after the protein shake, I might have, you know, do some more maintenance, easier work. Uh, so like emails or some easier kind of uh, admin administrative stuff. And after that, I'll go to the gym or go for a run, whatever the, the particular workout is for the day. After the workout, I might do a sauna, I'll have dinner with my wife. And after dinner, it's the not really like work mode. Although, you know, the last uh, eight months I have worked uh, after dinner as well quite a lot. But usually, you know, we're sitting on a couch watching something or doing whatever other like kind of a recreational leisurely activity, kind of uh, just downtime. And I'll go to bed around maybe 10 p.m. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I have a very regular consistent routine with that most of the days look like that unless i'm like traveling but even if i'm traveling i visit things like family members or going to some event conference or something then the day kind of still looks very similar uh, to that <laughs> i like I, li I like the routine i like the consistency and the habits and uh, just thrive in uh, making these uh, small incremental steps towards uh, whatever goal it is uh, in that uh, moment. And in what, what environment are you doing your, your daily routine here? Like uh, you have circadian lightning, I see you have some plants. And so how, how does it look like your environment? It's, uh, well, I got a standing work desk. I can adjust it with the, the remote and I'm on a walking treadmill. So the walking pad, so if I'm uh, usually doing something easier on the computer, then I'll uh, walk at the same time and get my steps in. I have right here, I don't have any like window or anything. I have window on the side, so, but I don't you know, look out that much out of it. Maybe sometimes if I'm taking a break from, from my eyes, but uh, yeah, I'm just uh, looking at the computer. I have a few houseplants 
and uh, that's uh, pretty much it for my office. Like I have my supplements in the, in a cupboard <laughs> next to me, and uh, most of the time I'm just uh, on the computer uh, working, and uh, I just more like to go outside more frequently. So I don't need to have a natural working environment because I'm going to go outside quite often. So and uh, get some uh, sunlight as well at the, at the same time. Move, eat and sleep. You were already like told me your routine. Anything else you make sure to, to take care of your sleep? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that I do is making sure that I'm not exposed to a lot of artificial light before bed. So like these kind of blue lights that I'm exposed to right now, I'm going to turn them off or dim them down to more amber and orange lights. So I have a pink Himalayan uh, salt lamp in the bedroom. I'll turn that on. I also wear uh, blue blocking glasses. So uh, I'll start wearing them a bit earlier before uh, bedtime. And uh, that's also going to filter out the artificial light because uh, it's going to suppress melatonin and uh, can also make you more alert. So I'll tr just trying to minimize uh, that. Right now that with the summer, we have a nice kind of balcony in our apartment. So the sun set actually directly sets into the window or like we can see it. So we open the balcony door and well, while we're sitting on a couch, we're getting this natural red light, which is one of the best things for your sleep and circadian rhythm. So I'm getting this red light that helps with melatonin. It's anti-inflammatory and um, has also skin benefits. But of course, it's not very powerful, but it's good enough from from the perspective of the, the sleep. Uh, you know, an hour or two hours before bed, I'm getting this very nice uh, red light if the sun is uh, setting. And uh, after that, I'm just going to, um, to put on the uh, blue blockers. So, so even if I am looking at my phone or turning on the bathroom light, then I'm not getting it into my eyes. <laughs> what other things I do is I stop eating at least four hours before bed. So I'm having my dinner at 5 p.m. and going to bed at uh, 10 p.m. So then I'll be also not digesting the food while I'm sleeping and I do notice that my deep sleep scores and REM sleep also kind of increases when I do that. In the past I've had later dinners, but uh, over the last you know two years or something I've uh, just eaten a bit earlier and yeah, it makes, makes the sleep uh, much better. I don't like to eat like super early, like I don't like to eat like 3 p.m. and then stop for the night. I, I like to have a, like a nice dinner and that makes me like nice and tired. And uh, usually it also just fits my daily schedule much better. So I'll finish work around that time and I've come from a workout and it makes the most sense for me to have the dinner at that time. Other things that I do, I'll take some supplements for sleep. Usually it's like magnesium, maybe 200, 300 milligrams. And I'll also take three grams of uh, glycine, maybe even five grams sometimes. And... Uh, both of them help with relaxation. Glycine also uh, lowers your body temperature, which is going to be good for uh, sleep onset and uh, staying asleep. And I'll also take like a microdose of melatonin on a lot, lot of the nights, so like 0 0.3 micrograms or 0 0.3 milligrams. And uh, microdose melatonin, I don't need it for sleep, but I take it for the like antioxidant effects. So I think that melatonin is a very powerful antioxidant and uh, very powerful longe for longevity, in my opinion. So I'm going to take that on a quite often, not every night, but uh, quite often. And uh, in my bedroom, I'm sleeping on like right now in the summer, I'm using the uh, eight sleep mattress. So it's cooling down the bed, lowers the temperature, so high, high body temperature and high bedroom temperature, reduce sleep quality. So I'm just trying to it's kind of it's just very convenient and it's amazing it lowers the temperature quite nice and it's much uh, easier to fall asleep in the summer i don't use it in the winter because it's already quite, quite cold so i don't need it at that time and i yeah i don't have anything any other i don't like technically i don't need any of this <laughs> like i'm one of those people who can fall asleep anywhere and i can fall asleep on the airplane while sitting and also while exposed to all the blue lights and listening to death metal at the same time and <laughs> so technically i don't need any of these uh, hacks but i'm just doing it for yeah because it does give me maybe like one percent extra benefits 
And uh, why, why not? Like, I do, I do think that, you know, you can't feel the antioxidant benefits of melatonin, but I do think that it's important, at least from the, the studies in other animals and also the association of, like, the uh, artificial light exposure and, like, diabetes and obesity and neurodegeneration even. So, yeah, I'm just not willing to sacrifice my melatonin levels, even if I don't need to wear the blue blockers, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well... I mean, but 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 I guess you have a sleep tracker, and your sleep tracker is punishing you when you are sleeping on an airplane, right? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, usually if I am sleeping on an airplane, then I'm not going to sleep the entire like eight hours anyway. So like, if I'm mm -hmm. traveling across the ocean or something like that, then uh, there's going to be I'm I'm just you know probably going to sleep like you know two hours, three hours, <laughs> something like that. So the you know if I wore an aura ring on the plane, then yeah, it's going to show very bad scores. Uh, at home, when I'm at home, the eight sleep does track the sleep quite nicely. And on those nights, I, on most cases, I'm getting still like, you know, 95 to 100 on the eight sleep. And uh, that's not, so that's not the same as with the other trackers, like the other trackers might give like different numbers, but I'm not losing a lot of quality in that uh, either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, even the ordering cannot handle time zone changes properly. So yeah. that's, that's another thing. Um, what about your movement? You have a heart rate of heart rate variability of a hundred around a hundred. And that's like, that's just, that's crazy. How did you get there? And what, what else you're doing? Yeah. So I think I've always had a bit of higher HRV. And uh, if I were to, you know, think about what are the biggest things that have given me the results, then they would be just staying uh, at good body composition. So not being overweight, uh, being more leaner and uh, exercising. Those are the probably the biggest contributors to my HRV uh, numbers. And uh, if you look at the like the studies, then uh, it kind of uh, pans out that the, that way as well. So like metabolic syndrome, diabetes, uh, obesity, sedentary behavior, they uh, do uh, lower the HRV with age. So like my age can also affect that. So uh, getting older typically reduces HRV and uh, more like stress. So psychological stress, and emotional strain, those things are lower HRV as well. So I don't have any of those things. I'm not obese. I don't have diabetes. I'm in good health and good body composition. And um, I'm also like not really uh, stressed out that much. And, uh, you know, I exercise quite often. So doing uh, some cardiovascular, although my HRV was high already before I did cardio. So I don't think the cardio necessarily is that important, but just any form of exercise uh, should be should be like added if you want to increase the HRV. And interestingly, there is um, one study finding like a linear association between daily step count and HRV. So the more steps you take, you know, up to 20,000 20, steps a day is linked to a higher uh, HRV, which, you know, probably because of movement, probably because of uh, losing weight and maybe maybe because of a uh, lowering stress as well in some sense. And maybe like saunas and cold therapy, they can also improve that. But uh, I don't think they're uh, like the biggest, biggest movers in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I'm doing sauna, I'm doing quad therapy, I'm exercising, I'm doing cardio, and and I'm not getting anywhere there. Although, speaking of obes obesity, like, look at me. So, yeah, there that, are, there are good... like, there are individual differences as well. Like, I, w I, w I wouldn't say that you need to compare yourself to uh, others with your HRV. So, uh, you can move your needle to a certain extent. Like, if you find your baseline is, I don't know, 45 then uh, you can reliably increase it to a certain extent. And we don't know how much you can increase it. Can you like double or triple it? Uh, who knows? But you can like move it. Uh, and uh, what matters more is the trend line. So like, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Or is it staying uh, stagnant? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's what that's what matters most because there might be some other you know, genetic differences or some other things that as all that affect that. And I wouldn't like be super concerned about because I mean, and there's no data that having a HRV of 100 already is somehow better than a HRV of 50. Like, at least in the studies, like a HRV of 50 is already in the general population the top HRV. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting for me because my HRV is around 40, but my resting heart rate is around 49, which is actually pretty good. So why mm. is my HRV so bad? And um, may maybe, maybe it's because of obesity, right? And speaking of obesity, the only things I've been, I, I, I can't hurt how to move. I haven't skipped a single workout for four years at this point. I, I conquered so many things, but I couldn't do one thing, uh, nutrition. So how are you in relationship with your food? Yeah, I've done like many different diets. The first diet I think that I tried was more like a regular bodybuilder uh, diet, uh, but I started it with intermittent fasting. So I did the 16 and 8 method intermittent fasting and eating like a higher protein, lower fat, maybe moderate carb uh, diet. So I was eating like cottage cheese, uh, chicken breast, uh, broccoli, potatoes, uh, rice, and uh, that kind of thing with the 16 and 8 method. I think it worked, you know, very good. Then after that, I tried out the keto diet for a few years. And uh, I mean, it worked as well, but I wasn't progressing uh, as well with uh, exercise as I wish I was. Maybe I was just uh, overdoing it with uh, both the intermittent fasting and uh, keto, but I do think that if you're exercising regularly and you're physically active, then it's more, I think it makes more sense to just eat carbs as well. And you don't need to do a keto diet or a low carb diet unless you maybe have some uh, blood sugar issues or something like that. That's why I've, uh, right now, of the four years or so I've uh, been eating, uh, I guess I don't have any real restrictions on my diet. Of course, I don't try. I don't. I try to not eat uh, like actual junk food or something. But um, you know, I, I don't have any worry about carbohydrates. I eat plenty of carbohydrates. Uh, I'm not low fat either, but I do try to stick to more of like uh, Mediterranean style diet. So I'll eat olive oil and fish and nuts and seeds as my main source of uh, fats. And uh, then then I'll have, uh, you know, protein comes from eggs, fish, mostly some meat, uh, beans, legumes, and uh, my carbohydrates are potatoes most often, but, you know, every once in a while, a few times a year, I'll have some rice or a buckwheat as well. And uh, then, you know, might have some grains as well, so like bread or whatever, not on a daily basis, but uh, a few times few times a year you know when I'm traveling for example or in a restaurant then I'll I'm not like afraid of foods if that makes sense um, you know I'm I'm very healthy I'm physically active so I have no, nothing to worry about any like food really harming me or making me gain weight if that makes sense and I think that's kind of the goal there's an, you shouldn't like be super afraid of foods as long as they're consumed in moderation and as long as your like other biomarkers are uh, good so yeah i don't have any like specific diet if i were to categorize it then it would be like a mediterranean diet with a bit more maybe carbohydrates and a bit more protein uh, as well mm. well you see this is one of the reason why i'm doing these interviews is because when you give an account like that and it might be useful for the listeners as well because you give an account like that we we get into your mind how you're thinking about food and and, and, and hopefully that changes our minds as well, who are listening to you and, and, and becoming more like you and less like us. <laughs> um, there is one thing that people often ask you about or, or asked you about years ago, which is autophagy, autophagy, auto, you will, you will say the correct word later. Now, I, I don't know much about that. But I coming from the, you know, the, the bodybuilder eating way that, you know, if it's catabolism, then it's bad kind of thing. So give me a pitch. What's, what's give me your pitch of autophagy. Yeah. So autophagy is this uh, intracellular process that uh, eliminates debris material and different kinds of uh, junk material that accumulates inside the cells. It is involved in many different kinds of diseases as well as uh, aging as well. So the older you get, 
or not not necessarily with everyone, but uh, with different diseases and different, uh, or you know, yeah, with aging as well, your uh, junk material accumulates, and also like this mitochondria inside the cells uh, become quote unquote broken or uh, less functional. So mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the hallmarks of aging. Um, autophagy is ab able to eliminate them through a process, process called uh, mitophagy, so mitochondrial autophagy. So mito autophagy is an important uh, process for longevity. It's uh, for sure like a, a buzzword <laughs> to a certain extent that we don't know necessarily how do you measure it, what are the different you know, most optimal ways to activate it and stuff like that. Yes, there are things like exercise and fasting and calorie restriction and coffee and some supplements that have been shown to increase autophagy, but uh, it's uh, hard to like measure it uh, like reliably. And even then you don't know how much is, uh, you know, enough or how much you need, uh, so to say. So uh, many people might think that more is better, but uh, it's actually not the case. Like sometimes it's, um, it's uh, you know it's uh, autophagy is also involved in some like negative uh, aspects. So some of the like uh, viruses or some of the malignant cells can also use the same process uh, to survive. So it's not uh, necessarily always good, and uh, you don't know <laughs> when or how much or uh, how little you would need. So it's much better to focus on like some of the other healthy lifestyle activities that you know yes like activate autophagy like exercise and making sure you're not overweight, but I guess you shouldn't like chase it. Uh, it's uh, not something that you want to uh, pursue just for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Well, moving on a little bit, uh, maybe this will be a quick question. It always was a quick question so far. Do you have any vices? Uh, like health or? <laughs> regarding health, yes. That would jeopardize your your way to immortality <laughs> <laughs> at least in the past i was more like sleep uh, deprived so like i uh, slept less and i what, what does that mean in aura scores um well me i mean my aura score maybe might have been like 70 80 something like that i you know i'm sleeping something uh, six hours is uh was something common and on some nights five hours uh, I used to do like also like this polyphasic sleep, so <laughs> sleeping only like two hours a day, divided oh. into twenty-minute naps. So I, I, I think I've uh, yeah been a bit more careless with sleep in my past. I think I don't think it has any long-term effects or has had any long-term effects on me. But uh, yeah, I'm right now trying to deliberately sleep yeah like seven to eight hours at least, and not like not like push through. Uh, that next another thing I wouldn't call it a vice, but uh, I think it's just worth mentioning. So like you know, I'm not like I said, I don't have any perfect diet or I don't have any specific diet. So you know, if I feel like having a cake or a pizza, then I'll eat it. <laughs> so I don't uh, worry about it, and um, there's no evidence that you know doing that is going to be somehow harmful, as long as you're you know on point and. Uh, pretty healthy uh, 80 or you know for me in my case 90 percent of the time so having birthday cake you know i have been like super strict about it as well when i was doing keto then i was like i, I never ate anything uh, that had sugar or carbs or something like that but uh you know since then over the last four or five years i've uh, been more loose with it i've actually lost weight <laughs> while doing that I've built muscle, my blood work is much better than it was in the past. So it's not that some foods are inherently bad, some foods are worse than others, but no food, no single food consumed in one occasion is going to make you sick or give you some sort of a disease or make you live shorter. <laughs> so like having birthday cake or uh, at Christmas having some whatever thing, or even like if you're, you know, okay, today I wanna, you know, have some sort of a quote unquote bad, worse food, then it doesn't matter in the long scheme as long as you're you know maintaining good body composition as as long as your uh, biomarkers are uh, good anything extra do you do anything extra like that other people don't tend to do in in terms of uh, biohacking let's say well in the longevity space a lot of people aren't still doing the saunas uh, i've been doing that you know since i was born pretty much 
and I think uh, the, the data about sauna benefits are also pretty clear by now and uh, it does appear, appear to reduce the risk of heart disease and Alzheimer's and all cause mortality as well. The reason for that could be, you know, whatever it could be because it mimics the benefits of exercise to a certain extent. It could be that you're getting activation of the heat shock proteins that improve your glucose tolerance and uh, like metabolism. And some people say that it's because of healthier or wealthier people are able to afford a sauna. So that's why those associations are there. But uh, it's important to realize the context of these studies. So pretty much all the studies on the sauna are done in Finland. Uh, you know, Finnish culture is such that almost everyone has a sauna. So there's more, almost as many saunas in Finland as there are people. You know, every house has a sauna, every gym has a sauna, every office building almost has a sauna. So everyone can do it pretty much. And it's also part of culture that both the unhealthy and the healthy people do it. So it's not that, that everyone who goes to the sauna in Finland is like this yoga person or, you know, some sort of this uh, Whole Foods who, go, who, who only <laughs> shops organic and Whole Foods. No, like in Finland, the beer guy, the beer belly guy also goes to the sauna and they're actually probably doing that as frequently as the healthy person. So, you know, it's very common for Finns and Estonians and, you know, all the other Nordic countries and Russians uh, to drink alcohol in the sauna and it's just part of culture. Everyone likes it and uh, they do it while partying, while eating chips and, you know, it's not that there's a healthy user bias with the sauna in these studies because it's done in a particular culture where where both the unhealthy and the healthy people do uh, the sauna. So I think that's a good indication that it's not just the healthy user bias or it's it's not just this uh, epidemiology that is actually there, something uh, related to the, the physiology. This is time for me to ask the anthropology, anthropology question. I've been thinking about this for a long time and I realized I could just ask ChatGPT, but something doesn't add up to me. Many nutritionists who are, who like anthropology, they're talking about the hunter gathering phase of society and how they were eating and we should eat similarly. But weren't the much, much longer time frame while we were basically just fish, you know, we were living in the water and stuff. So, so why, why don't we look at that? that period and why why the hunter gathering period have special special status um well i think it's because the anatomically modern humans so the homo erectus they were quote unquote like hunter gatherers so those are our you know closest uh, like relatives <laughs> in through evolution and uh, we aren't that much different from anatomy from a physiology side than uh, those individuals uh, where of course you know the, there's no like i guess no established human diet so humans aren't omni aren't uh, carnivores or they're not herbivores or something like that we're omnivores we're like eating whatever we find <laughs> and uh, that's the reason why we survived uh, because of just eating whatever that we could find uh, whether that be other animals slimes, uh, insects, uh, fruits, vegetables, tubers, uh, whatever, it, what might have been fish, uh, seafood. So we ate everything that we found or was edible. You know, if there were Big Macs in the savanna, uh, they would have eaten those as well. So it's, it's, I don't, I don't think that it's, you know, it's not really a very, uh, you know, worthwhile or it might be worthwhile, but it's not uh, something that we should like really focus on, like what the hunter gatherers ate because they first of all we live in a completely different environment we're completely like a different lifestyle as well so we shouldn't like try to emulate the diet of hunter gatherers because there's probably some mismatches uh, there because of that and also like our goals are probably different so i mean it's wrong to see, think that the hunter gatherers lived only until their 30s so that, that's not true like they they could have lived easily to their 70s if uh, they didn't die during childhood. So just the high rates of infant mortality are what uh, reduced the average life expectancy of these hunter-gatherers. But at the same time, 
there's like almost no hunter gatherers who live to the age of 100 <laughs> or 110 and 120. And of course, that could be because of just medicine. So if you get medicine and you get good health care, then uh, that's what uh, mediates the results. But uh, it kind of just goes back to the end, like the environment and the lifestyle. So and what's the goal? So, you know, I wouldn't say that you need to emulate because we don't emulate almost anything else from the hunter gatherer lifestyle. Like we don't emulate the uh, the sleeping environment. We don't emulate the mating tactics of the hunter gatherers. We don't emulate the uh, societal structure of the hunter gatherers. So I don't think it makes sense to try to be like a hunter gatherer in terms of your diet. Of course, there are some people who do be better with a more ancestral diet. And there are, yeah, like some foods obviously that are pretty modern and very like new to to our uh, diets. So like different kinds of refined oils and refined grains. Yes, they generally do like worsen your blood work and they are associated with poorer health outcomes. But again, like the dose matters and uh, the dosage makes, makes the poison. I mean, you should yeah try to eat like 80% or as much as you uh, prefer, quote unquote, natural or whole foods. But, uh, you know, there's still a lot of processed foods, quote unquote, that are still healthy, like olive oil is processed to a certain extent, cottage cheese or cheese itself is processed, but cheese is uh, relatively like uh, benign as a food. And, uh, you know, whey protein is one of the best, most bioavailable forms of protein in the world. And it's processed. It's actually uh, like an ultra processed uh, food. <laughs> so it's not that the natural is good or bad. It's what like what's the actual effect it has on our bodies. Uh, yeah, because I mean, even then, there, my goal isn't to live like as long as a regular hunter gatherer or even like a regular human. You know, my goal would be to live as as long as it's possible. And for that, you need to do things that uh, people in the past didn't do. <laughs> because if uh, that thing worked, then they would have lived to the age of 150, for example. But you know, no, no people has lived over the age of 122, which is the record uh, currently. Yeah. So you need to do something that is new or something that uh, changes changes like the the pattern. Yeah, we don't want to be the Luddites. Yeah, speaking of something new and changes the pattern. Sleep well, eat well, exercise well. When you say these things, everyone knows and everyone agrees. This is the consensus. But speaking of something new, what is? A thing that you believe strongly to be the case, but many people disagree with you. Um, maybe, I guess maybe innovative fasting is something that has become less popular over the last few years, and a lot of like longevity scientists and experts might be against it right now. But uh, I think, well, well, at least what's their argument is that it's not better than regular calorie restriction and uh, it can make you lose muscle, which is like a net negative. But there's no actual studies looking at that innovative fasting is going to be making you lose muscle or that it results in lower muscle gain as long as you're like doing resistance training and as long as you're eating enough protein. So yes, like a lot of people might struggle meeting their protein target with innovative fasting, but it doesn't mean that that intermittent fasting is inherently making you lose muscle, <laughs> so to say. And yeah, there's just been no human studies uh, that shows uh, that it's going to make you lose muscle as long as you're doing resistance training and as long as you're getting enough uh, protein. Yeah, you know, in the world, olden days, it was that you have to eat five times a day, right? Five times a day diet. And if you yeah. were not doing that, then you, you were not following the the zeitgeist, the, the, the culture. And at that time I was, I was, uh, reading a lot of Lyle McDonald and, you know, he seemed to me reasonable and he was saying that it doesn't matter how many times you are eating during the day. And then in the 2020s, um, these, uh, warrior diet or, or, or one OMAD, uh, these, uh, one one meal a day and anyway i'm butchering the names but the, or the point was that you are eating on the days when you are working out and you try to not eat or only eat just a little protein on days when you are not 
when you're not working out and you know these these were always interesting to me i eventually ended up uh, doing one meal a day for a long time and then i stopped i just i just become a three meal a day regular person <laughs> at this mm. point <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure what but, but yeah it's it's really interesting and of course the recent studies that uh, well look at that uh, you can you can eat a lot of protein and your body is going to use it over 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 maybe even days right you, you know what i'm talking about that yeah, was... the 100, 100 grams protein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, since I am an evil capitalist, I would like to ask you to tell people how can they, what can they, they buy from you? What value can you offer for them? Such a value that they are even willing to give you money for. Yeah, so of course they can check out my books on uh, Amazon and um, I also have a course, longevity course, a 10 week uh, course that's had uh, hundreds of uh, people joined already over the last year and it pretty much covers exactly what you need to do for exercise, diet, supplements, sleep, and uh, many other uh, blood work topics as well. So it tells you actually the you know, optimal uh, blood work ranges and uh, the optimal exercise routine. So, you know, like I said, there's no, we don't know 100% what is the most optimal uh, path to longevity, but I think this is the closest one that uh, I've managed to create that is based on, yeah, like the latest science regarding risk of all cause mortality and uh, life expectancy. Simland, it was a, uh honor and a privilege talking to you. Thank you very much. My pleasure.